Tom uh, is known from, uh, from OpenText, uh, a great innovative Canadian uh, uh, company, success story, known for his uh, interest and participation in uh, public policy, um, the Jenkins report, um, uh, which has a few recommendations left perhaps to uh, implement, and, uh, and uh, currently the chair of the National Research Council. And Tom will set the stage for us in the discussion that's going to follow today. Tom. Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, I had two coffees this morning, so I hope you've all had at least one coffee. We're going to cover a lot of ground in a very, very short period of time. Um, it, this is uh, uh, innovation, growth uh, for our country, very, very difficult topic. Uh, we've been at this, uh, you know, just like all the other countries, especially within the OECD, for quite some time. And it's. Um, there's some challenges for us to discuss today, and why are we not moving forward on certain areas? And uh, I hope as we go through the schedule today, we'll see a, a, you know, a, a bright spotlight on a few of the issues that we're having as a country, great difficulty grappling. Uh, and I'll, I'll try and set the stage as best I can, but I have 29 minutes in which to do it, so I'll, I'll try and do it very uh, quickly. And you'll see the, the four areas uh, that I thought would be most useful uh, to talk about today, and it, and it reflects the different uh, breakout panels that we're going to see. So let me start with framing things. Uh, as Ed Marie had said, uh, it's not just about growing, it's about inclusive growth. Uh, part of the dilemma that we're having globally is different nation states are achieving growth, but maybe perhaps not a just growth. And so it's not just growing, it's making sure that we don't leave large parts of our society behind. So that makes it more complicated, but if we want to have a successful society, you got to do it. And so we have to think more deeply about how we achieve that growth. And the other thing that we're going to have uh, that sort of hangs over all of the topics is the impact of digitization. As many of you know, it's, it's an area that I've spent my career in. And I made a note here under just growth that blue collar workers, you could argue in the developed world, did we or did we not really do them justice? Because the same thing is about to happen to the white collar workers. Many of your uh, children that you've sent off to professional degrees are going to come out or have already come out and will not find the job that was there in your generation. And that's, that's a new challenge for us. So it's not just what happened with the blue collar that we're seeing now the impacts of, but with the white collar, it's coming. So we've got sort of two macro effects going on, the globalization of the economy and how we reorder within the global value chain, and this tremendous digitization pressure. Both are forces that you know, quite frankly, uh, Canada, we're 2% of the world GDP and, and shrinking as the others grow, and less than half of 1% of the world population. So our ability to really have an influence on these trends is quite limited. So we are, in, in a sense, price takers in this regard. So we have to think about those sort of two macro things. Now that said, though, we're Canada. We're, quite frankly, we can get most people that have to make decisions about this in one room. It's a huge advantage we have as a middle power. So I hope today we can make some progress on that. So what does success look like? Quality of life, standard of living, achieve inclusive growth, participate in the global economy, anticipate the impact of the fourth industrial revolution. The real question is, is how do we go about doing this? And I would pose to you that all the answers we seek are right in front of us. The challenge for us, though, is to recognize it. And I'm going to try and highlight a few of those things. My background, as Ed was mentioning, I've sort of had my uh, uh, feet in three different places uh, on the business side with uh, a company like OpenText or sitting on the board of Manulife and that sort of thing and, and getting a perspective from that point of view. 
uh, chairing NRC and before that on Shirk Council. And then of course a long time association with a variety of universities, uh, the latest one being the Chancellor at the University of Waterloo. So when I speak ill of any one of these three groups, I'm one of you. <laughs> so because I'm going to be harsh on all three groups because we're missing it. Uh, collectively as a society, all three groups that are represented here, the academic area, the public sector area, the private sector area, there are places where we can and must do better. Uh, various policy reports that Ed had mentioned uh, uh, for the insomniacs, we Canadians really like to study these things, so we have lots of evidence, lots of study. The challenge for us is to take those uh, uh, sort of recommendations or the jewels that are there frame them up in the current context and, and go forward. But I would point you to two recent uh, papers that came out that were review papers, uh, one by Paul Booth that reviewed uh, the uh, Wilson panel and Andre Solzenko that reviewed the panel that I was on. Regardless of what we say about innovation, the definition of innovation, bird score, GERD score, whatever statistic OECD or others come up with, this is one that really must worry us more than anything. At a macro level, once you've you know, factored in everything from multi-factor productivity, et cetera, at the end of the day, if our productivity lags our biggest trading partner, that's an issue. And Roger Martin did a lot of work on this uh, at the University of Toronto to show what the impact of this is. For every household in the country, the impact is about $10,000 a year. And that's a, that's a stunning deficit for us, and we've had this for quite some time. So regardless of what we may think about all the nuances of some of these measures, this macro measure should concern us greatly. The conundrum that we've had, you know, we've certainly been following this for, for many years, but the conundrum I've circled here Despite all of this, our business investment has declined, and we can get into definitions, Frascati manual, Oslo manual, all the different definitions of is this innovation, is this R&D, et cetera, white lab coats. But the problem is we have a trend where we're actually spending more on higher ed and less in industry. That's a problem. Those trend lines make the problem worse. And I'll come back to that in a second. And yet, Corporations, private sector, are not really penalized by this. So this is also a conundrum for our policies about the private sector. How can this be? How can this be that our R&D spending is declining, and yet profits, and especially uh, as compared to the Americans, we're doing quite fine. In other words, what this graph is telling us is if you're a CEO on Bay Street, you're not terribly motivated to change your behavior right now because you're making money. So packed in there are different issues about inclusive growth, issues about our role within global value chains in the world. Look at that. We have very, very low exports. And our participation in the global value chain should concern every person in this room. Our private sector has to do more to get into global value chains, and yet, they are not quite motivated to do that. Now, I'm not saying that we do something draconian, but we do need to think about why is that. So let's talk about the players in our innovation ecosystem. So on the one hand, you have industry, you have academia, and then we really have two parts of government because federal, you know, we're, we're a very decentralized federation compared to a lot of other nation states that we compare to. For example, uh, we'll compare to Singapore or we'll compare to Israel. These are very small countries that are very, very tightly integrated with each other and can act very, very quickly. Uh, it's hard for us to compare to those, uh, those governments because we're not constituted the same way. So we have to think about both federal and provincial in this. And I would put to you that there's really three things that each has to do. We have to either force, encourage, and, and we'll see what Roger Martin says about this in a second, our private sector to go global. Uh, unless we're gonna put our head in the sand and we're gonna put up trade barriers, et cetera, uh, we better go global with our private sector. They better participate more in the global value chain, which is the great measure 
of productivity, great measure of are you a valuable participant globally. Our governments need to be customers. I'll come back to that in a second, but that's really hard to do. And finally, our universities, our colleges, they need to participate and allow commercialization to occur. And you'd say, well, why is that, that you would say that? And I'll try and develop that a little bit more too. But be a customer. Let's start with that. We have the answer in front of us for many, many years. The Americans have done this. It's called the SBIR program. It's an outstanding program. And I would encourage you, if you don't know about this program, find out about this program. Uh, years ago, uh, we went to the OECD and we sat with the chief economist of the OECD and we said, how is it that the Americans, generation after generation, industrial phase after industrial phase, they're always so innovative, they're always so productive. And he leans back in his chair and he says, oh, it's very simple. They have squared the circle of public procurement by a democracy. Let me repeat that. They have squared the circle of public procurement by a democracy. We then went to Washington and had many examples. My, my favorite being laptops. We sat with the General Services Administration and said, could you explain this to us? And uh, the person there said, well, do you know where laptops came from? And we assumed you know, it was some place in Silicon Valley or something like that. He said, no, the Internal Revenue Service. We were using desktops from IBM and our IRS people were piling them into a trunk of a car and driving 500 miles to a client and they were wrecking them all. So we needed a portable computer. And this was in the era of the IBM PC. So they gathered together Dell and, and Compaq and IBM, et cetera, and they said, we have 5,000 consultants. The person who can make the best, they didn't call it a laptop at the time, in fact, the first version showed up in a Samsonite briefcase and it was all cut up, an, an original IBM PC, that's how they did it. The point of the story, though, is they used the buying power of 5,000 people. They didn't subsidize, they didn't do any of that. They just said, we're gonna be your first customer. And a laptop was born. And we could go on with stories of NASA, I'm sure you're familiar with many of them. SBIR program is a very sophisticated program that has been built up over the years where the US government mandates that Congress must do a set aside for small business innovation and research. And for that extra money that they get, they, today I'm sure any department or agency within the administration wouldn't consider it extra money, but, but the reality is they have to show productivity on, on like product and service year over year. It's a tremendously powerful program. The other issue we have in small and medium is growth coast strategy. We actually, within the OECD, pretty consistently now are showing very good results at startup. Quite good. Uh, internationally, when I travel around, people recognize us for what we've done in startups. And many of you know some of the, uh, the incubator network that's been created, the accelerator network. That's great public policy. Great. We did really well on this over the last 20 year period. And so whether it's Invest Ottawa or Mars or Communitech and uh, OCE, there's, there's tons of them. Uh, we had a gap and filled it a few years ago on the venture side called VCAP to basically breathe life into an area, an asset class, which had really been oversupplied in the labor sponsored era. So we'll see how this plays out, but, but we certainly seem to be doing well in this area and we have to keep monitoring and keep investing. But our big issue is growth codes. We have a gap. We, we are having our startups acquired and they're being acquired before they really give benefit to society because they're being acquired and they're either you know, uh, uh, moving uh, to Boston or they're moving to Asia or they're, doing, uh, they're going to the, the valley. And our challenge now is how do we create those unicorns? How do we get more of them? Because on the very far end, when we get to mature, the answer is not protectionism. We have to think of this as a conveyor belt. 
If we erect barriers, etc., we're just kidding ourselves. We, we tried that in the 70s and 80s, didn't work out very well. And that's why we went to NAFTA, etc. So global trade matters, but we have to make sure we've got that conveyor belt working all the way through to multinational. And uh, QG100, what an excellent, excellent organization in Quebec. They did such a great job. And, and I like to call them, if we think of uh, uh, the incubators as sort of undergraduate, QG100, OG100, it's graduate school because they've survived being a startup. They're now trying to become a billion dollar company. And I think we need to do more of that. And I put in quotes here, we need some kind because usually when they grow, they need talent and capital. They need the talent of someone that's done it before, and they need larger pools of capital. Those are our sort of two areas that I hope we can think about, and I'm sure uh, panel members today will talk about. On the mature side, this is a little bit more complicated, but we have to think about our biggest companies as well. Because as we saw with Nortel, you can just ask anybody from Canada, Big companies matter, because without the big companies, it's so much harder for the small companies to enter into those global value chains. I've seen it. I've started as a startup from the University of Waterloo and gone to become a billion dollar multinational. There is a huge difference, and you need both. If we just focus on one or the other, if we love small companies only, we're missing the point. You have to have a vibrant ecosystem. We've got to make sure those big companies want to stay in Canada, do research in Canada, and prosecute global value chain strategies in Canada. But here's one of the fundamental issues that we have. A foundation principle of these reports is that competition leads to innovation, which leads to productivity. Remember that we're about 30% down on our productivity? Well, why is that? Perhaps it's not that we need more R&D investments or we need more productivity. And my all-time favorite is our entrepreneurs need more ambition. Canadian entrepreneurs are just fine. The challenge that we have, especially in our large companies, is how do we create competition? because we have sectoral regimes that we brought in about 30 years ago for a very good reason. So please don't misunderstand, the Wilson Report was not about removing all the legislation around banking or telecommunications, et cetera, but we do need to modernize it. And we have to be careful how we modernize it because it would be crazy if we increased competition in telco and then destroyed our telco industry. What's the point of that? We have to be nuanced about how we do this, but we need to have a conversation in the country about how to do this so that our existing companies, our telecommunications companies, our banks, our transport, become global champions. How do we encourage them to go out into the world? This is a huge issue that we've got to return to. The Wilson Report came out just as the global recession occurred. So it really didn't get a lot of attention. I'd encourage everyone, if you're thinking about long-term innovation practices in the country, we have to think more deeply about mature innovation, about our m &Es. Because suboptimal competition will lead to suboptimal innovation and suboptimal productivity. And getting that balance between national control and global competition, that is a huge challenge for us. And I would dare say one of the sort of enabling issues underneath our declining bird scores. Now, Roger Martin's written on this quite extensively at U of T, and he advocates for a balanced approach. Because if we don't have a balance, if we were to just open this up to global competition, we would lose the very thing that we're trying to encourage. So it's, it's not a, a simple, uh, approach, but we do have to think about this and be nuanced. Now, before I had mentioned government as a customer and why that was so important to the Americans and why is it so important to us? Well, here's the research. The research is, is quite instructive. If you really want to innovate, innovation does not occur by subsidy. Innovation does not occur by research. And, and this has been one of the great, uh, uh, I, I would propose, confusions that we've had in our country. Innovation is driven by a demanding customer in a competitive situation. 
That's what drives innovation. Customer that sits there and says, no, nope, not good enough. Go away, come back again. Research is very important, but if we want innovation, if we want jobs, if we want commercialization, we have to have demanding customers. Government has an incredibly important role to play in this regard. So let's, let's think about this now, because it's not innovation or invention. You have to have, it's like landing an airplane. The pilot comes on and says, hey, we're circling, we're about to land. Would you like to use the engine or the wing? Please use both, right? And that's our challenge, because when you think about it, innovation is really turning a great idea into money. And invention is turning money into a great idea. We need both. It, it's crazy for us to have a discussion about, well, we don't need university-based uh, uh, inventions. What we need is private sector-based innovation. We need both. You have to do both. If we want to compete with the most productive countries in the world, we have to square the circle. We have to understand this. Until we square the circle, we will not compete with the very best in the world. Huge challenge for us. So better coordination between the groups. Some examples of coordination that way. And again, as I had mentioned right at the beginning, the answers are right in front of us because other countries have exactly this issue. You know, as Ed said, uh, in some ways we have one arm tied behind our back because we are such a wealthy country. We, we really, we don't think of that as Canadians, but when you travel the world, uh, you know, I, I remember uh, one time uh, being at EU and uh, they said to us, well, what are you doing here? You're Canada. And we said, well, we're trying to be better. And, and they said, but you're Canada, you have more water, more diamonds, more gold, more iron ore, more, more whatever than anyone else in the world. And, and you're here trying to be better? We're trying to, you know, we're trying to scratch out a living here in Europe. And that's the perspective of the world. And in a way, it's true, when we have a commodity cycle bust, then we don't feel like that. But part of the dilemma that we have is we don't do some of these hard things quite simply because we don't have to because we are so fortunate to be born and or live in this country. But at times, as Ed said right at the beginning, when we're in a commodity bust, then we start to think about this. But I would put to you that the impact of digitization is playing out on us now. Because if you look, we are now in the third year of a 75 cent dollar, and we're not quite having a jobless recovery in the center east of our country, but pretty close. It's a big issue. And so those two engines of our growth economically that we've enjoyed since World War II, eh, maybe, maybe it's not quite working the way we expected it to be. Steve Plaz had uh, some pretty good comments on this a few weeks ago. I think we should be very careful. So what does a country like Germany do? After World War II, they knew they had an issue they knew that they had to survive on their wits, what was between their ears. And so what did they do? They created the Fraunhofer set of institutes. There's 67 of them now. They started with one. This is almost 70 years old now. But it is a template of how you bring multinationals, government at the federal level, government at the lender level, small and medium sized together around clusters. We don't have to look very far to see some world-class examples. So just like SBIR, there's Fraunhofer. It's very instructive that we should look at that. And, and by the way, the Germans, they're very aware that innovation must also be complemented with invention. So they have the Max Planck system, they have the Leibniz system. They're very, very clever how they create this. It's highly competitive. They run it in many ways, the way we do SHRC and NSERC, et cetera. So it's highly competitive, but it's very mission-oriented. They have a very specific area that they're going after. Talent. This is something, uh, and I sort of jokingly refer to it, traveling the country, a lot of times Canadians wring their hands and say, well, we're just not as competitive as the Americans, or, you know, we, we just, it's not in our DNA. I, I can tell you from having traveled the world and had a Canadian management team, they're very good. Our, our Canadians are great at global, 
uh, uh, competition. We're just great. We just have to be forced to do it sometimes, but we're great at it. We are so accepted throughout the world. Our brand is excellent, and our people are wonderful to manage the cultures of the world. I've watched it. it, it we have a tremendous, tremendous advantage. However, one of our challenges is people without jobs and jobs without people. And this has been plaguing us for the better part of a decade. And so John Manley at the Business Council uh, uh, convinced uh, myself and Elizabeth Cannon and Ann Sato uh, if we would lead a group of 37 uh, university and college presidents and private sector CEOs to come together to look at work integrated learning, co-op, internship, and coordinated research as a precursor to say something like a Fraunhofer. And what could we do? And this group has been meeting for two years now. And it's just an excellent group. And, and I know uh, I saw Suzanne Fautier here. Uh, she's part of the group. It, it's just a, it's an excellent group. And they're really coming to grips with, you know, Dave Mackay of Royal Bank said, why shouldn't we promise every student in the country at post-secondary that they have some kind of work integrated learning experience. Because otherwise, our statistics are showing we leave them behind. It's not fair to them. So how do we organize ourselves in the country to give that opportunity to every student? So those are the kind of things we're working on. Uh, it represents about two thirds of the GDP of the country uh, and the vast majority of the post-secondary education students. And then the last thing I'll say on talent, believing matters. Uh, I know from Waterloo, uh, you know, in that ecosystem, the Governor General, uh, he noticed that the, the folklore, the stories that were shared between entrepreneurs really encouraged those entrepreneurs to try more and try harder. I can tell you as a young entrepreneur moving to Waterloo, if you didn't go global, and this is 30 years ago, if you didn't go global, it's like you're missing it. And that, that is part of the atmosphere there today, but they believe it. And the GG who's going to uh, join us later on uh, today has really uh, been so wonderful to dedicate uh, so much of his time to encouraging the country and helping to change the culture on innovation and started the Governor General's Innovation Awards. Uh, national partnership with 57 partners throughout the world, or throughout Canada rather, uh, and wrote a book on the history of Canadian innovation. And so he'll be here later on uh, to talk about some of this, so I, I won't uh, dwell on it. But it's important that we change the channel here, that we tell our youth, hey, we're very good at this. Go on out there and go for the podium kind of thing. Last thing I'll touch on is infrastructure. Uh, you know, I was in a meeting a few weeks ago, and, and again, I'm, I, John Manley's here somewhere, so I'm going to quote him again. He, uh, there's John. Uh, John uh, uh, leaned back in his chair and he says, you know, the big issue about Canada is that natural resources is our family business. It is. And we're crazy to not recognize that. We, it, it, it shouldn't be the only business, but it's such a core building block. We're one of the few countries in the world that get this bounty, this treasure. Um, but we have to have a bold vision about this. And so I, I just you know, put up here Pierre Burton's comment. Uh, about the, the last spike, the national dream. We have to think bold when we think about this, but a, 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 a challenge for us is that railway, that infrastructure, is the same infrastructure we're using 150 years later. How can that make any sense at all? And so one possible vision of infrastructure is get out a map and look at where Ring of Fire is, look at where potash deposits are, look at where Plan Nor is, look at where Fort Mac is, and all of a sudden you start to see that, well, actually, they're all up in the subarctic, and yet all our transportation systems are from Confederation down along the border with America. Surely to goodness, that doesn't make any sense. And of course, when you think of things of freight and people, because remember, those people weren't there 150 years ago. Lac Magantic was not there. And so a challenge for us is how do we rethink infrastructure, whether we do this or something else. The point is, we have an opportunity to be bold. We have an opportunity to rethink 
what should this look like for the next 100 years? This is the opportunity before us to seize this. Because if we keep going the way we're going, Andre Silzenko did a very good uh, presentation to the Senate last week, and he made the following observation. If we do a point thing, whether it's a pipeline or a railway or whatever, we aggregate all the issues in society, so-called social license, et cetera, around a single point benefit. Why don't we aggregate all the benefits at the same time that we're going to aggregate all the issues? So let's solve all of the issues for our society at the same time. Now that's counterintuitive, because normally as Canadians we're incremental. And yet, that's what Western Australia did. I was in a meeting a few years ago, and some of you in the room were in the meeting with me, when I asked, why are so many Canadian companies pouring money into Australia? And they looked at me and they smiled and they said, oh, well, you don't understand. You can actually get things built in Australia, right? So where capital goes matters. And capital went to Australia, not to us. And five African countries came together to do the same thing. Our challenge as we deal with infrastructure, how do we create this? Yes, we're going to talk about capital today, but we also have to think about vision and we have to think about how we actually do it. And you would say, well, that's Australia or that's Africa. The Americans did it. In 2002, the Americans took a part of DARPA and called it ERPA. And that changed the world. Changed the world. They declared it a national security issue. And 15 years later, it has changed geopolitics because that's where fracking came from. And they changed their position in the world. So that's it, folks. That's your 30-minute summary. Three programs I hope we emulate, Fraunhofer, DARPA, and SBIR. And I'll leave you with a sort of a heavy thought. Our, com our competitiveness as a country and as a society will depend on our ability to make these strategic policy decisions. If we're going to maintain our way of life, we've got to grapple with some of this. And uh, I, I hope everyone here enjoys themselves today. I know I certainly will and look forward to speaking to you later on today when we recap. Thank you.